And the basic message was, faith without good works is dead. In other words, put your money where your mouth is. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, show it and prove it by the way you live. The topic this week is, whatever has happened to sin. I must admit from the very beginning that the title of this week's talk, Whatever Has Happened to Sin, like so many of my pearls, has been stolen. Some years ago, Dr. Carl Menninger of the Menninger Psychiatric Institute wrote a book called Whatever Has Happened to Sin. I've never read the book, but I am a name dropper. In this book, Dr. Menninger describes the following experiment. He had a man stand at a very, very busy street corner with his eyes cast down to the ground and his arms folded on his chest. Now every now and again, the man would look up, he would stare at a passerby, point a finger at him and say, guilty. And immediately afterwards, would close his eyes again, cast them down to the ground, fold his arms back on his chest and remain perfectly still for a few seconds. And then he would look up again, stare at somebody else, point a finger at him and say, guilty. The man repeated this ritual over and over and over again. Dr. Menninger, for his part, interviewed the people that the man had fingered and stared at and accused of being guilty. And he asked them, how did you feel when the man said you were guilty? And each one of them said something like, I wonder how he knew. What a marvelous experiment. I wonder how he knew. If you met me any place in a busy shopping center or any place in public, you could come up to me, stare at me straight in the face, point a finger at me and say, guilty. And you'd be right. You wouldn't know the exact nature of my sins unless I told you, but nonetheless, you'd be right. I am guilty. And I, for my part, could point the finger at you, stare at you straight in the face and say, guilty. And I'd be right even though I don't know the exact nature of your sins. But the fact of the matter is, we are, after all, only human, and we're frail human beings, and we do sin, and we do wrong things. All men have sinned, and have come short of the glory of God. And to say that you have not sinned is to make God out to be a liar. But if we confess our sins, we have before the Father an intercessor who is just, Jesus Christ, and he can be trusted to forgive our sins. Now, in case you have just joined us, this is The Catholic View, a program about Catholics for everyone. The topic is, whatever has happened to sin. There is a wonderful story and a true story that demonstrates how universal sin is. It's a story about leprosy and a heroic priest named Father Damien. Leprosy is a dreadful disease. And society years and years and years ago dealt with it in a very harsh way. Lepers were cut off from society, driven off into desert places to live by themselves so that they couldn't affect the rest of the population. In 1868, the Hawaiian government had ruled that anyone who had leprosy would have to be sent to Molokoi to stay there in order to protect the rest of the population from the disease. Now a man, Father Damien, later to be known as Damien of Malachi, heard the call to go and look after the poorest of the poor, the lepers of Malachi. Now this was no namby-pamby plaster saint. 
Damien was an impulsive, hot-tempered, strong, energetic, immensely zealous Belgian farm boy who went to the Fathers of the Sacred Heart because he wanted to be a missionary and bring the fight to distant lands. And so Damien ended up on the island of Molokoi. The first night there he slept under a pandanus tree. When he awoke he found what a place of horrors he had reached. To begin with, there were the leprosy victims with running sores, repulsive deformities and sickening smells. There were no houses to protect against the cold winds. You had to walk two miles to get fresh water. It soon became apparent what the situation was. People came here not to live, but to die. Well, Damien nonetheless began to look after the poorest of the poor, these awesome lepers of Malakoy. He baited them, he washed their sores, he bandaged them, he said mass for them, he fed them the body and blood of Jesus Christ, he preached the gospel to them, he listened to their sins and in the name of Christ he forgave them, he anointed them when they were dying, he was with them morning, noon and night as an angel of mercy. Damien tells horrendous stories. In one account I read, Damien was looking after a poor leper who was just about to die, and he was anointing him with holy oil and praying over him, as is recommended in the epistle of James. And he suddenly was aware of the fact that the bottom of the leper's bed had begun to move. Well, he looked down, and the whole bottom of the bed, the poor leper's feet, were alive with maggots. Damien described how he rushed out of the room, repulsed, and when he got outside, he vomited. Damien said mass for his lepers every single day, but he was always left out because here were his poor and fortunate lepers, sick and obviously dying, and his body was healthy. Now, one day, Damien spilled scalding hot water on his feet and felt no pain. Apparently, one of the telltale signs of leprosy is that the infected area does not register any pain when it's hurt or damaged, and Damien realized he had become a leper. That morning, with tears of joy running down his face, he addressed his congregation and he said to them, we lepers. Damien was one with his lepers in now in every sense of the word. This marvelous story demonstrates to me that all of us really are lepers because sin is leprosy of the spirit. Sin disrupts our relationship with God it causes tremendous pain in our lives and it disrupts our relationship with other people. We are all spiritual lepers. At Queen of Peace Church where I say Mass Sunday after Sunday, I stand in front of my congregation and after I greet them in the name of Jesus Christ, I say to them, my brothers and sisters, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Lord and Saviour of the world is with us at this moment. Let us call to mind our sins and humbly turn to Jesus Christ for forgiveness. That's who Catholics are. We're a church of sinners. In case you've just joined us, this is The Catholic View, a program about Catholics for everyone. The topic this week is Whatever Has Happened to Sin. A preacher put this question to a class of children. If all the good people were white and all the bad people were black, what color would you be? Little Mary Jane replied, Reverend, I'd be streaky. And so would the preachers and the priests. And so would the Mahatmas, the popes and the saints. 
a man one time was looking for a good church to attend, and he happened to enter one in which the congregation and the preacher were reading from their prayer book. They were saying, We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. We have sinned in the sight of Almighty God. The man dropped into a seat and sighed with relief as he said to himself, Thank goodness I found my crowd at last. Attempts to hide your sinfulness, your streakiness, will sometimes be successful, but always dishonest. I remember one time one of my parishioners said to me, Father, you're a good man. And I had to say to her, No, I'm not a good man. I'm a sinful and a selfish man, but Jesus Christ has laid his hands on me. That's all. Look at some of the great, great, powerful sinners of the Bible. King David, a peeping Tom, an adulterer, a murderer, a hypocrite. And yet, from David's house was born Jesus the Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Moses murdered a man and hid his body in the sand. Yet Moses was deeply loved by God. He walked with God. Everybody knows about Judas, one of the twelve, who betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ for money. And we all know about Peter, blustering, arrogant Saint Peter. He swore up one side and down the other that he would never betray the Lord. And yet, three times he denied that he even knew who Jesus was. And of course, there's Doubting Thomas, who swore that he'd never believed that Jesus had risen from the dead unless he probed Jesus' wounds with his hands. It is fashionable today to parade the sins of priests and bishops and ministers of the gospel on the front pages of papers. It's sad, but it's real, and it happens. We shouldn't be so shocked. I suppose the sins of ministers and priests and bishops is proof to us that the Church has a divine foundation, that it cannot be destroyed even by the sins of its chosen representatives. It is not up to us to sit in condemnation of these men and women who sin in this way. After all, who among us is without sin? But we should pray that the Holy Spirit will come upon them and they will be given the gift of holy repentance. Now again, in case you've just joined us, this is the Catholic View, a program about Catholics for everyone, and we're discussing whatever has happened to sin. My name is Father Patrick J. O'Doherty. Catholics draw a distinction between original sin and personal sin. A personal sin would be like if I committed murder, or I stole something, or I committed adultery. But original sin is the sin of Adam and Eve. And we are all born with this sin. We are all born with the blood of Adam, the blood of disobedience running in our veins. Original sin is not a personal sin, it's a tendency towards sin. The greatest insight I ever got into original sin came to me from a teenager. I was wandering around the church uh, where I was stationed, muttering to myself, as I usually do, and from behind me I heard, Hello, Father. And I turned round, and there was one of the local teenagers. I knew him well, because some months earlier I had caught him breaking into the church at night, and because I hadn't turned him into the police, he looked on me as a type of friend and seemed to look up to me. And... He had appointed himself as guardian of the church property to protect it from thieves like himself. Anyway, as we were walking along, 
talking back and forth, he mentioned to me how a friend of his was living rough out in the woods by himself. I asked why, and he told me that the police were after him and that they were charging him with breaking into a Quick King store. Like a lot of adults dealing with teenagers, I asked the wrong question. I said to him, what was his name? And he answered me by saying, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. You might remember a few years ago, there used to be a program called Dragnet. And it opened with that particular phrase, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. And you may remember that Jesus one time said, the kingdom of God was like a dragnet that was cast out into the sea, that brought in a hall of all kinds. Well, anyway, his phrase, the names have been changed to protect the innocent, had a deep impact on me. I began to realize that for the scripture to come alive, we have to change the names of the main characters. In other words, for me to understand the story of Adam and Eve, I have to become Adam. And I have to realize that the story of Adam and Eve is the story of every man and every woman that you see. It's your story and it's mine. Let me give you an example. Adam and Eve were told by God not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were given free will. They chose to disobey God. Now, I have free will and I, in my turn, have disobeyed God. I have sinned. The first impact of Adam's sin was shame. And I am ashamed of what I have done. I certainly would not stand up in the pulpit and announce to everybody the exact nature of my sins. And Adam hid from his wife and hid from God among the trees of the garden. And don't we do the same? Don't we hide from one another? We put on masks and, and we pretend to be what we're not. And we certainly are ashamed in front of God. I know that during times of great personal sin, I'd be too embarrassed to even look at a picture of Jesus. I imagine the picture was frowning at me. And just like Adam, I have to work to earn my daily bread. And I have frustrations and doubts and fears and confusions in my life and worry about health and worry about the future. And the ultimate payoff is that I will die just like Adam. So every man you see is Adam and every woman you see is Eve. On Ash Wednesday every year, Catholics go up to their church and the priest puts ashes on their forehead and he says to them, remember man that you are dust and into dust you shall return. In this way, we identify with Adam and Eve. But way back then in the Genesis story, there's a wonderful, extraordinary prophecy. God promised a new Adam and a new Eve. He said to the serpent, because you have done this, because you have led mankind astray into sin, a curse shall you be beyond all the wild animals and all the creeping things of the earth. You shall crawl on your belly and eat dust every day of your life. And then he gave us this wonderful prophecy. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. You will lie in wait for his heel, and he will crush your head. Now, thousands of years later, we realize that the new Eve is Mary, and the new Adam is Jesus. And Jesus, by his death and resurrection, has crushed the head of the serpent. Watch how Adam and Jesus parallel one another. Watch how Jesus reverses the sin of Adam. Adam disobeyed God. Jesus was obedient even unto death, death upon the cross. Adam blamed his wife. Jesus cries out from the cross of Calvary, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Adam returned to the soil from which he was made. Jesus rose from the dead and became a life-giving spirit. Adam hid from God. Jesus, with his dying words, cried out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And Jesus is here today. The new Adam, 
willing and anxious to forgive our sins. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus said, I thirst. And Jesus was not thirsting for water or for wine, but he was thirsting for your love and mine. He was thirsting to bring us to himself so that he could forgive us. So to summarize, every man you see is Adam and every woman you see is Eve. And because of the sin of Adam, because of original sin, and because of our own personal sins, we are destined for death. We are not saved, but Jesus has come among us. And by his obedience, even unto death, death upon the cross, Jesus has conquered the power of sin, and by his resurrection, he has conquered the power of death. So if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you take up your cross each day and follow in his footsteps, if you deny yourself, then you too will cross the final Jordan into the new promised land, which is heaven, which is eternal life. In case you have just joined us, this is The Catholic View, a program about Catholics for everyone. The topic this week is Whatever Has Happened to Sin. My name is Father Patrick J. O'Doherty. What about personal sin? A personal sin is the sins that you and I commit. If I committed adultery, or if I murdered somebody, if I stole the property of another, if I damaged the reputation of another, if I told a lie, all of these are personal sins. Now, does Jesus forgive personal sin? There's a wonderful story in the eighth chapter of John's Gospel where a woman who had been caught in adultery was dragged in front of Jesus. The leaders of the people said to Jesus, Moses commanded that such women should be stoned to death. What do you have to say? We are told that Jesus simply bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger, but they persisted and they wanted an answer. So Jesus stood up and he said to them, let the man among you who has no sin cast the first stone at her. When they heard this, beginning with the eldest, they left. Jesus was left alone with the woman and he straightened up and said to her, Woman, has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, sir. Then Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. I ask you to pay particular attention to the words of Jesus. He says, Neither do I condemn you. Go away and commit this sin no more. Now, I know that everybody listening to me has a this sin in their life, something that you have done or that I have done and in moments of darkness it comes back and haunts us we know we've done wrong and yet at this moment on this channel that plays for the most part romantic music if you say to Jesus I am truly sorry for my sins then even now Jesus says to you through the foolishness of my preaching neither do I condemn you Go and commit this sin no more. Most people who know anything about Catholics know that when they commit sins, they go before their priest so that they can receive through the priest the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Naturally enough, people ask, well, why go to a priest? Uh, why not confess directly to God the Father? Well, the answer is very simple. Jesus set it up this way. He gave his church the power to forgive sins. And you'll find this in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, around verse 19. Jesus had risen from the dead. He appeared to his disciples. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive men's sins, they are forgiven them. If you hold them bound, they are held bound. The first action, the first action of the risen Christ after he rises from the dead and greets his apostles is to give to his church the power to forgive sins. So when a Catholic goes before 
his or her priest and says, I have done wrong, I have sinned, and confesses their sins. It is not the priest or the bishop or the pope that forgives sins. It is the risen Christ present with his church all days till the end of time. There is no point in any Christian denying that Jesus is with his church. Did he not say to us, Behold, I am with you all days to the very end of the world? If you're not a Catholic and you have that desire to express sorrow for sin, I recommend to you Psalm 51. It's the psalm that the great King David used to express his sorrow for his sin after he had murdered Uriah and stolen the man's wife. The opening lines of the psalm are, Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. In your great tenderness wipe away my faults. Wash me clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I am well aware of my faults. I have my sin constantly in mind, having sinned against none other than you, having done what you regard as wrong. Yet, since you love sincerity of heart, teach me the secrets of wisdom. Purify me with hyssop until I am clean. Wash me until I am whiter than snow. I have here in front of me a lovely prayer called a special act of sorrow, and if this expresses the sorrow you have in your heart, simply say amen at the end of it. Forgive me my sins, O Lord, forgive me my sins, the sins of my youth, the sins of my age, the sins of my soul, the sins of my body, my idle sins, my serious voluntary sins, the sins I know, the sins I have concealed so long and which are now hidden from my memory. I am truly sorry for every sin, mortal and venial, for all the sins of my childhood up to the present hour. I know my sins have wounded thy tender heart, O my Saviour. Let me be freed from the bonds of evil through the most bitter passion of my Redeemer. O my Jesus, forget and forgive what I have been. Amen. Again, I thank you for listening to The Catholic View, a program about Catholics for everyone. The topic next week has the title, How Odd That God Should Choose the Jews, but not half as odd as those who choose a Jewish God and hate the Jews. Hopefully in this program I will deal with religious hatred. A tourist said to his guide, You have a right to be proud of your town, I was especially impressed with the number of churches in it. Surely the people here must love the Lord. Well, replied the cynical guide, they may love the Lord, but they sure hate each other. Next week, we'll talk about religious hatred. God bless you. If you wish to receive the blessing of Almighty God, bow your head and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with kindness and give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a staycation right here in town. It's Super 8 Motel Ocala, right down the road on 40, just west of I-75. And they're pet friendly. Have truck parking. Free breakfast. Yum, yum. A swimming pool. A kiddie pool. And veterans get 10% off. It's a staycation at Super 8 Ocala. Call today, Super 8 Ocala at 352-629-8794. Again, 352-629-8794. Folks, RL here for Dairy Queen again to tell you about what's hot and what's not. Dairy Queen has some of the best char grilled chicken breasts on earth, as well as their chicken breast salad. And the burgers are exceptional, cooked on a real grill for the best flavor and less fat. And for dessert, blizzards are unequal to personally. Banana split is my all time favorite. Dairy Queen Silver Springs, where we always treat you like kings and queens. WOCA. Okay.
election to former Vice President Joe Biden, according to a new interview in the New York Post. In a story published Saturday night, Trump told columnist Michael Goodwin that the election was stolen. It was a rigged election, 100 percent, and everyone knows it. Trump goes on to say, this is the greatest theft in the history of America. The Democrats and Joe Biden claim it was the fairest election in U.S. history. USA Radio News is not calling the race until all legal challenges are resolved. Hundreds of thousands of Trump supporters converged on Washington, D.C. Saturday to show support for the president, shouting, stop the steal. A federal judge has ruled that acting Homeland Security Chief Chad Wolf has not been serving lawfully in his position and his suspension of DACA is illegal. Judge Nicholas Garofis, while issuing the ruling, said conferences will be held to work out his ruling, but concluded that when Wolf issued the memorandum to suspend protections under DACA, it is not valid. USA Radio News. Balance of nature is fruits and vegetables in a capsule, changing the world one life at a time. The product that you have given me here is, as far as I'm concerned, sent to me from heaven. I love it a great deal. It's hard to find anything that's real nowadays. I enjoy it immensely. It's making my life so much better. I feel so much better. And during this pandemic, I have no worries whatsoever. My immune system has got to be at a top-notch level. I don't seem to get colds or anything. I don't know what getting sick is anymore. This is so cool. Experience the Balance of Nature difference for yourself. Right now, Balance of Nature is offering free shipping and 35% off on any new preferred order. Call 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751. Or by going to balanceofnature.com and make sure to receive this special radio offer by using discount code USA. President Trump said Friday that a coronavirus vaccine could be widely available in the United States by April and praised the efforts of Operation Warp Speed, the public-private partnership to develop and distribute a vaccine. Pfizer was given nearly $2 billion for the vaccine development. The money came from the Health and Human Services and from the Department of Defense. A South Korean biotechnology company and the Russian government have entered into an agreement to produce more than 150 million doses of Russia's Sputnik V coronavirus vaccine. Russian officials said Friday that it partnered with GL Rafa to produce 150 million doses per year and distribute them globally. Production will begin in December in South Korea, India, Brazil, and China, among other countries, with distribution starting in January. Russia was criticized for its premature announcement in August that it had developed the world's first coronavirus vaccine before the country had completed phase three trials of Sputnik V. USA Radio News. Working from home? I'm Chad Dodd, veterinarian and consultant to Limp Bells. Here's some tips for keeping your dog fit while staying at home. Find 15 minutes twice a day and walk your pet at a decent pace around your place. Play hide and seek by hiding some kibble or favorite toys and letting your dog find them. If you have stairs and your dog is mobile, walk up and down twice a day for 5 to 10 minutes. Or better yet, try a power walk on your terrace or backyard for some fresh air. There are more helpful pet care tips at youmove.com, spelled Y-U-Move.com. National Football League has 12 games scheduled for Sunday, five early games, six afternoon games, and one late game. With half the season being played, who's starting to emerge in the two conferences? Sports journalist Rich Eisen is loving the AFC's Las Vegas Raiders and their quarterback. Derek Carr, man, for the Raiders. He is playing his head off. Dude, the Raiders are hosting Denver, who they should beat. I know that's always a dangerous thing to say in the NFL. They could be 6-3. and 6-3 and three going into their Sunday nighter against the Chiefs to try and sweep them. I told you, I love Jacobs. I love Waller. I love Crosby. I love Abram. They have got players, man. And if Carr, I, didn't I say this like week three after they beat the Saints? They could yeah. be a problem. Mm-hmm. If Carr is efficient, doesn't make mistakes, right. and that is right. the way he is playing. And the stats prove it. The Raiders will host the Denver Broncos at 4.05 p.m. Eastern from the brand new Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. Looking at the NFC, Michael Strahan tells Fox Sports who he likes in the mix. When you look at the NFC, the best team in the NFC right now looks like the Saints, but you cannot discount Green Bay the way that they've been playing. But then again, Tampa Bay dominated Green Bay, and then you have that team in Seattle that's been traveling a lot on the East Coast, giving everybody fit. So, And they're getting healthy at the same time. But I would say NFC, number one team right now with the Saints. But as we know, these things change week to week, and I'm still not convinced that the Saints are that team that is at next tier, next level just yet. For USA Radio News, I'm Lance Pry. If I'm not commuting anymore, where do I really want to live? 
While you handle life's questions, Merrill Guided Investing helps you manage your portfolio and invest for your next move. With the option to work with an advisor at a low cost and minimum. Merrill, a Bank of America company. Visit MerrillEdge.com slash investing goals to get started today. Investing involves risk. Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith Incorporated, both a registered broker-dealer and investment advisor, member of SIPC. Investment products are not FDIC insured or not bank guaranteed and may lose value. Our veterans risked it all to protect our freedom. One of the best ways to say thank you is to volunteer to support them. At a time in history where kindness is a virtue, volunteering means a lot. For over 47 years, Help Heal Veterans, a not-for-profit organization, with the support of citizens like you, have delivered therapy kits to veterans who need them. To volunteer or learn more, visit HealVets.org. That's HealVets.org. I'm not going very far. It's too uncomfortable. I'm in a hurry. Sometimes I just forget. There's no such thing as a good excuse for not buckling up. You're not only putting yourself at risk of injury or death, it could also cost you lots of money. Cops are writing tickets, so why take the risk? Do the smart thing and start buckling up every trip, day or night. Click it or ticket. Paid for by NHTSA. Time now for another episode, another adventure, another hour with Dr. Jack Stockwell, who runs a clinic out in Salt Lake City, Utah. He and his wife are GAPS practitioners. He's a board-certified Nuka chiropractor. All kinds of different standards are set for Nuka chiropractic. It takes a little bit more expertise to be able to work and have results. I will speak from experience over the years I've known Jack. Every time I see him, I get this great adjustment on my neck, and it really does. It, it's amazing how the body works and how it's effective in helping your whole body. You won't know that till you experience it. Maybe being connected in one way or another to Jack through ForbiddenDoctor.com is a good place for you to start. Speaking of starting, I want to know what the nature of fecal material is, how it is how it forms its consistency, why do some people have certain issues with their fecal production, what does it do, what happens if it doesn't work right, uh, the body is supposed to perform wonderfully well when it's uh, synchronistically functioning, but if it isn't, and so uh, in talking about fecal material, let's uh, start with the basics, Jack, in terms of where it comes from, how it's produced, how do people know? Because as you get older, there's nothing worse. And I've been through this with people that are around me that were older and didn't have proper bowel movements, and it really became something that they were obsessed with. Why are we so obsessed with our bowel movements and fecal <laughs> material? You know, it is. It's kind of funny at times, and yeah, gastric noises and gas and everything else is kind of funny in its moment, but then there's times when it's not funny, as, right. as you're bringing it It isn't up. if you're going through it, no, not at all. If you yeah, think of it like this, the, the human digestive system is the world's most powerful disassembly plant. Mm -hmm. You take whatever you're going to eat, you know, whatever you're taking. What a great way, by the way. Let's stop and think about that for a second. What a great way of reference. It's a disassembly plant. Yes. takes apart all of the things Everything. that you're putting into your body, the food that you're putting in your body. You know, right? it was a Ford that gave us the assembly line. And if you can imagine for a moment, it's easy to do, that Model T going backwards instead of coming out as a final car, going backwards through the system, if we could run the movie backwards and see it turn into 30,000 little pieces. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing, wh whether you're sitting down to eat a steak or you're sitting down to eat a bunch of uh, fruit or you're eating the, a, a normal breakfast, something that Mother Nature produced. I'm not talking about box cereal and these kinds of things because your body yeah. has a hard time with that. But anything Mother Nature made that's got a certain amount of fat protein content, the fats are going to be emulsified down into the smallest little tiny pieces possible, which is what your bile is for. The proteins it, with the stomach acid is going to be broken down into amino acids, peptides, and, and when all this stuff finally hits, 
the small intestine after it comes out of the stomach, it's going to be broken down further and further and further as it goes through the small intestine, which is a soup. It's just very watery, very soupy mixture. And when it finally hits the colon, and you know right there by your appendix is mm-hmm. where something called the ileocecal valve. It's where their food material moves from the ileum into the cecum, which is the beginning of the large intestine. It, at this point, this soupy stuff starts to turn into, or starts to dehydrate. This is part of what the colon's job is. It has several functions, but it starts to dehydrate this to turn it into a mass. The majority of that mass of the, of the feces is bacteria, bacteria that fills up the entire digestive system. That bacteria is there for a very good reason. It keeps us alive. We keep the bacteria alive. The bacteria does an awful lot of good things for us. So when you can understand that what is leaving the small intestine into the large intestine is really a very soupy mixture, uh, it, has, it has very little mass to it at all, and then it hits the colon. The colon starts to dehydrate the thing, pull water out of it through very, very tiny little pores so only water comes out. Then it starts to solidify. And it has to solidify in order for us to have controlled bowel movements. Now, as long as we're eating the kind of foods Mother Nature asks of us to eat, we're going to have healthy elimination. When we start fooling around with a bunch of other stuff that has no fiber in it or it has too much fiber in it or it has uh, preservatives or or it's been demineralized and denaturalized and just covered up with, you know, like uh, corn chips and potato chips and, and things that have been altered from the way nature makes it, the body has a hard time not only digesting this stuff but getting it to move through the digestive tract. I remember in school when we were studying um, uh, radiology, pathology, just the pathology that shows up in x-rays when you look at an x-ray, and we would look at severe constipation. We would look Mm -hmm. at problems that have digestive origin uh, problems, just the horrible way the guts would end up looking on an x-ray. And so the older we get, unless we're very, very careful about what we eat, it's going to tend to gravity pulling our guts what, what down say, lower. What does that mean about? I'll give you an example of something okay. that I went through. I was just thinking about this because, you know, not to get too personal, but it was something I was <laughs> was on my mind Go for it because of my own experience. I decided last week. I, I'm not much of a cereal fan. If I have been eating cereal over the past 10, 15, 20 years, it's uh, pretty much much been um, sort of a handmade uh, thing. Um, it, the the things that you can find in the store aren't to my liking, so I'll maybe mix a few things together. Uh, but I I went out uh, for whatever the reason I, I was in the cereal aisle and I saw Frosted Flakes, so I bought some fl- Frosted Flakes and I had some. Actually, I've had them over the last four or five days. Uh, it was what I grew up on. Every morning before I went to school, I fixed my own breakfast, and it was Frosted Flakes with milk, and maybe I put some blueberries on it or something like that. And so uh, the last three or four days, I've had a change uh, since I've been eating the Frosted Flakes, and I wasn't even sure why until you just said what you just said mm-hmm. about uh, you know what happens when you put that stuff in your body. My body was used to it when I was a kid, not used to it now. So I'm guessing that the body, my body's reacting to it, doesn't like it. Is that what it's telling me? Well, just imagine that you have a business that transports material across the state line, whatever it is. And all of a sudden, somebody brings in the tractor trailer, and the trailer's sitting there for you to move it across to another state, and there's no wheels on it. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at this big 55-foot-long box, and you're sitting there, what in the heck am I supposed to do with this? That's kind of what happens when we start eating the kinds of foods or have a history of the kinds of foods that our normal peristalsis of the gut that moves things through. There has to be an anchor to it. There has to be a certain amount of fiber. There has to be a certain amount of solid liquid uh, mm-hmm. proportions in order for the body to handle this stuff, not in just digesting it, but it's got to move it on through the uh, disassembly line until yeah. it gets down to the bottom where it can get rid of it. Yeah. And when there's no wheels, 
it has a hard time moving the stuff. So you eat prepared cereals for breakfast. You eat fast foods with French fries and uh, white bread and all this kind of stuff for lunch. You come home at, in the evening and eat dinner out of a box, a bag, or a can that you throw into the microwave. You're going to have gastrointestinal problems. Well, there it is. That's a, that's a great explanation of how the system works. And that's what our uh, mission is here, to talk about how your body works as we continue. Good Day Health, Dr. Jack Stockwell here with me. I'm Doug Steffen. If you're taking care of your body well, congratulations. What are you doing, though, for your mind? Are you taking the same care? Do you supplement Whatever it is that's in your supplementary routine, Jack and I talk about that every week. We'll talk about some important supplements, as a matter of fact, during the course of the program today. One of the things that I swear by now is the dietary supplement Prevagen. Prevagen gives you a healthier brain, and therefore your life is better. So take care of your brain like you're taking care of your body. Add a proven brain health all natural supplement, Prevagen to your daily routine. Do that and you'll be happy because it fixes problems. People complain as they get older about short term memory. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. What we've forgotten. Brain health supplement Prevagen is the secret to making this work better. That is your, the part of your brain that is into short term memory. Add Prevagen to your daily routine for improvement in age-related cognitive impairments. Prevagen, healthier brain, better life. Success breeds envy. This is Emotional Management. I'm Dr. Christian Conti. The more successful you become, the more envy you will draw from others. People will be jealous of what you have and of what you've accomplished. And when people are struggling in envy, they tend to lash out. So be mindful that the more successful you become, the more others will try to tear you down. My advice to you is to reframe how you see the hatred and envy coming your way. For example, you might just look at envy as a compliment. It's a marker in the path to success that everyone encounters. And it's not good or bad or right or wrong. It's just a natural part of the evolution of success. The more successful you are, the more others will want what you have. And if they can't get what you have, they'll try to tear you down to what they have. But as my good friend, the NFL legend, Ray Lewis says, just keep going on. To hear more from Ray and me, listen to our podcast, Tackling Life. I'm not going very far. It's too uncomfortable. I'm in a hurry. Sometimes I just forget. There's no such thing as a good excuse for not buckling up. You're not only putting yourself at risk of injury or death, it could also cost you lots of money. Cops are writing tickets, so why take the risk? Do the smart thing and start buckling up every trip, day or night. Click it or ticket. Paid for by NHTSA. KFC's Colonel Sanders here. We all love sitting down to a home-cooked meal with family, but there's rarely enough hours in the day to do the cooking. So let me do the cooking for you. Well, not me personally. That's just a turn of phrase. Your KFC will do the actual cooking. The point is, let someone else do the home cooking for you. Come to KFC and pick up a $20 fill-up. That's eight pieces of chicken or 12 tenders and all the fixings to feed your family. Order ahead or use contactless delivery at KFC.com. Limited time only at participating locations. Only prices may vary. Tax and substitutions extra. Delivery service and additional fee supply. Dr. Jack Stockwell is here. One of the things I like about our visits together is what we share. We have such a broad array of things. And I think the general public is interested. Yeah, yeah, we're into COVID and we'll talk about that during the course of the program. Hard to do a medical show without talking about COVID, but there are so many more things, including what's the subject matter of our Good Day Health podcast. You'll recall that there are two podcasts here. Uh, the new one that Jack has is a COVID update, basically. It's podcast number 204, uh, so it gives you an understanding of the cases of uh, this and the mortality and how that has changed over the course of the disease. So that's there. We also have a focus on white blood cells in the current Good Day Health podcast with Dr. Jack. That's the second podcast, two different podcasts, one Jack and Mary do, one that Jack and I do. We have a discussion of the relationship between the pancreas and the kidneys and the liver that's very important for you to understand. You need to know how your body functions. And with Alex Trebek passing away 
of pancreatic cancer, even more important to know how your pancreas works. So I think we'll talk about, I, I do want to talk about uh, Trebek passing a little bit and the function of the pancreas and why it is so deadly. At any rate, we have the discussion of how all of your internal organs work. That is in the current podcast at gooddayhealthshow.com. That's gooddayhealthshow.com. Find it uh, there or wherever you get your uh, podcasts, all right? That's a good cue. Jack Stockwell and our focus on the supplement of the week. We've been talking about elimination, Colax, which is uh, one of the supplements I've never heard about from Standard Process. Jack, you'll have to uh, clue us all in uh, as we get into the holiday season and overeating and all that. we got to know how to keep our body functioning well. That's up next as we continue the focus on your health and well-being with lots of important information. Dr. Jack and Dr. Doug here at 21 Past the Young. It's totally normal to be constipated with belly pain, straining, and bloating again and again. No way. Maybe it's occasional constipation. Maybe it's not. You could have a chronic condition called irritable bowel syndrome with constipation or IBSC. Linzess or linaclotide is a prescription that treats IBSC in adults. Linzess works differently than laxatives to help relieve belly pain and let you have more frequent and complete bowel movements. Individual results may vary. Do not give to children less than six, and it should not be given to children six to less than 18. It may harm them. Do not take Linzess if you have a bowel blockage. Get immediate help if you develop unusual or severe stomach pain, especially with bloody or black stools. The most common side effect is diarrhea, sometimes severe. If it's severe, stop taking Linzess and call your doctor right away. Other side effects include gas, stomach area pain, and swelling. Maybe it's not occasional constipation. Learn more at Linzess.com or call 1-800-L-I-N-Z-E-S-S. You may be able to talk to a doctor online. Visit Linzess.com, sponsored by Allergan and Ironwood. Sail alert at Banana Republic Factory. Take up to 75% off everything, plus an extra 40% off. Save on comfy faves like cozy sweaters, soft hoodies, and more. Find your nearest store or shop online only at Banana Republic Factory. The friends and family events begun at Gap Factory and GapFactory.com. Get 50% off everything right now. Plus, shop new doorbusters, including our Gap Logo Crew Neck Sweatshirt, from $20. Find it all at Gap Factory or GapFactory.com, now through November 12th. It can be difficult to notice that your brain may not be functioning as well as it used to. The signs of aging can be subtle, but now it's easy to do something about it. Help your brain with Prevagen. In a clinical trial, a subgroup of adults with mild age-related cognitive impairment taking only one Prevagen a day were shown to improve in measures related to memory. Prevagen, healthier brain, better life. Statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Dr. Jack Stockwell, Doug Stephan, uh, I made reference to your podcast. So will you explain, I know you have before and you will probably again, what I've been trying to get people to understand as the hysteria continues, there are a lot more cases, but a lot fewer deaths. How does that square up, Jack? Uh, Imagine this. Um, You're going in the living room and you decide you want to move this little end table a few inches away from where it is right now. Maybe it's too close to the sofa or whatever else. And as you move it, a spider jumps out from underneath. Oh, wow. What do you know? A little spider and it runs off under the couch or whatever else. You don't worry about it. And then the next day you decide... Man, you know what? I think I'm going to move a few more pieces of furniture. And every piece of furniture you move now, a spider jumps out from underneath of it. Say you move nine of them, you just saw nine spiders. The day before, you saw one. That doesn't mean there's a 900% increase in spider population in the house. It just means you're looking where you weren't looking before. Mm -hmm. So when you start doing an awful lot more testing... The false positive rate is through the ceiling. Yeah. Obviously, you're going to end up with more cases. Now, when this thing all broke, you know, January, February, March of last of this year, 
they were talking about an infectious fatality rate. And the way you determine the IFR is you have to do, you have to have a positive blood test. And then you have to see that person uh, go through the processes and end up deceased, dying from what was in the blood, not anything else. And those numbers were so low, they couldn't scare anybody. So they moved to case fatality rate. <laughs> and at this point, all they have to do is, yeah, it looks like a good COVID case to me. And then they go on and die because of comorbidities and because of a bunch of other reasons. Suddenly you've got a death rate that just scares everybody to death. So a lot of the specialists who have been banned from Facebook, they've been banned from Twitter. Nobody will listen to the, and these are, these people are coming from Stanford. They're coming from Johns Hopkins saying, wait a second, wait a second. Just look at the CDC's numbers week to week because they'll tell you the truth about the whole thing, but the press won't. And when you look at the CDC's weekly numbers, this is nothing more than just a bad flu. So it leaves, it, it begs the question, then what the heck is going on? Well, we can go off in a hundred different directions as to what I think is going on. But unless you look at the real reason as to why these people have passed on, as opposed to what it looks like they But they keep on. arguing that point. Well, but they still died of the effects of COVID. Okay, oh, well, yeah. Yeah. how do you argue just with as, that? Just as we do every year with influenza A. We're going, you know, that progresses on to pneumonia. Remember when this stuff first broke, these people weren't having lung problems in the sense of some infectious problem that they were going after with incubators. Remember the incubator, or not the incubators, yep. the, uh, the whatever you call them, uh, were causing more deaths than they were being saved by the ventilators, excuse me. The ventilators, the, ven yeah. the ventilators were killing people, especially in New York, because they found out the problem was a hypoxia type of thing. They, they were getting air. Nobody knows even what that is. What is hypoxia? Well, hypoxia is where extremely low levels of oxygen into the blood. Okay. The, the, if you took somebody from sea level... So the ventilator pulled, kept oxygen from getting into your system? The, the ventilator happened? caused rupture of the lung tissue. Mm -hmm. they, they were getting oxygen. They were breathing oxygen in. The oxygen was getting into the lungs. It just wasn't getting onto the hemoglobin of the blood. And so there were some warnings that came out as early as February. Wait a second, wait a second. This isn't what we think it is. This is a hypoxia problem. It's a low oxygen problem, not the inability to breathe oxygen. Well, that, and, of course, we could go on in something else with that for a while, too. But the important thing is, is suddenly it became a case fatality problem. And so that's why the numbers of all you hear about is the increasing numbers here in Utah. The numbers, the, the numbers, if you understand what they mean, it's time for people to relax, you know, do the protocols that are necessary to knock this thing down. But to think it's a death sentence, uh, it just isn't so. That's what Jack is basically saying. You're listening to Good Day Health, Dr. Jack Stockwell and Doug Steffen here. Fever is a leading symptom of the coronavirus, so take your temperature twice a day with the Exergen Temporal Scanner. It's quick and easy to use, and its accuracy is backed by more than 80 clinical studies. Have your family start and end their day with the only home thermometer used and recommended by hospitals, doctors, and nurses. Your family can take their temperatures in seconds to know where they stand in the fight against COVID-19. Protect your family from the spread of this deadly disease, and stay safe with Exergen. I'm not going very far. It's too uncomfortable. I'm in a hurry. Sometimes I just forget. There's no such thing as a good excuse for not buckling up. You're not only putting yourself at risk of injury or death, it could also cost you lots of money. Cops are writing tickets, so why take the risk? Do the smart thing and start buckling up every trip, day or night. Click it or ticket. Paid for by NHTSA. Javier's auto body is colliding with a shortage of licensed techs. That 2017 is waiting on a clear coat. That 09 needs his left rear sanded, pounded, and painted. And the guy over there is waiting on an estimate. It's time to hire. I need Indeed. Indeed you do. The moment you sponsor a job on Indeed, you get a short list of quality candidates from our resume database. Indeed delivers two and a half times more hires than the other branded job sites combined, according to Breezy HR 2019. Visit Indeed.com slash credit and get a $75 credit for your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. 
like a bed that's really firm. I need something a little softer than that. Rest easy. With the Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed, you can both adjust your comfort with your Sleep Number setting. Can it really help me fall asleep faster? Yes, by gently warming your feet. Okay, but can it help keep us asleep? It senses your movements and automatically adjusts to keep you effortlessly comfortable. Sleep Number. Proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. It's our Veterans Day weekend special. Save $1,000 on the Queen Sleep Number 360 Special Edition Smart Bed, now $17.99. Plus free delivery when you add a base. Ends Wednesday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. USA Radio News with Lance Pry. President Trump appears to be nowhere close to conceding the presidential election to former Vice President Joe Biden, according to a new interview in the New York Post. In a story published Saturday night, Trump told columnist Michael Goodwin that the election was stolen. It was a rigged election, 100 percent, and everyone knows it. Trump goes on to say, this is the greatest theft in the history of America. The Democrats and Joe Biden claim it was the fairest election in U.S. history. USA Radio News is not calling the race until all legal challenges are resolved. Hundreds of thousands Thousands of Trump supporters converged on Washington, D.C. Saturday to show support for the president, shouting, stop the steal. A federal judge has ruled that acting Homeland Security Chief Chad Wolf has not been serving lawfully in his position and his suspension of DACA is illegal. Judge Nicholas Garofis, while issuing the ruling, said conferences will be held to work out his ruling, but concluded that when Wolf issued the memorandum to suspend protections under DACA, it is not valid. USA Radio News. Do you have health or energy challenges? Would you like to support your health and energy from a product that people consistently feel the uplifting and health-building effects from the first day they consume it? I introduce you to Green Meadow Whey, the only whey protein powder from grass-pastured cows that is processed in a manner that ensures that the proteins and amino acids remain in their correct geometric shape that the body can use. The naturally occurring proteins, peptides, and amino acids in Renatured Whey are proven to support multiple aspects of human health, from complementing your immune system to neutralizing chronic inflammation, to supporting detoxification, to stabilization of blood sugar, and more. Additionally, due to the Tesla-like frequencies encoded into Green Meadow Way, it is a dramatic support for your energy and mood. And it is an excellent emergency preparedness food with well over a five-year shelf life. To order, call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988-3325. Or visit GreenMeadowWay.com. GreenMeadowWay.com. Freedom doesn't start in the White House. It starts in your house. Here's Helen Kreeble. The Michigan State Legislature spent weeks debating a bill that would pressure fast food restaurants to stop offering Happy Meals with gender-specific toys. There were committee hearings about the cultural effects of giving kids little race cars or Barbie dolls. Legislators worried about the practice of asking parents if they wanted the Happy Meals for boys or girls, possibly leading to identity crisis or or worse. Surprisingly, no witness questioned whether or not there was any proper role for government in the issue. Examples were made of McDonald's and Burger King, but those are both private companies. The deals they make with their customers are private exchanges, none of the government's business. The free enterprise system is called free for a reason, and it's just not that complicated. For more information, check out our podcast at lensofliberty.org. Success breeds envy. This is Emotional Management. I'm Dr. Christian Conti. The more successful you become, the more envy you will draw from others. People will be jealous of what you have and of what you've accomplished. And when people are struggling in envy, they tend to lash out. So be mindful that the more successful you become, the more others will try to tear you down. My advice to you is to reframe how you see the hatred and envy coming your way. For example, you might just look at envy as a compliment. It's a marker in the path to success that everyone encounters. And it's not good or bad or right or wrong. It's just a natural part of the evolution of success. The more successful you are, the more others will want what you have. And if they can't get what you have, they'll try to tear you down to what they have. But as my good friend, the NFL legend, Ray Lewis says, just keep going on. To hear more from Ray and me, listen to our podcast, Tackling Life.
The second half hour of Good Day Health with Dr. Jack Stockwell here. Our focus on understanding what's going on, the latest in COVID. I'd, even though you're not a vacciner and I'm not really much on this coronavirus vaccine, uh, but Pfizer says the early data, uh, that's what's coming out this week, show that it's 90% effective. Okay, so what happens to the other 10 percent? <laughs> well, it's something it's less. Sweet but, you know, goodbye. this is when I heard that Pfizer was announcing 90 percent effectiveness with a vaccine. It kind of, you know, I kind of thought, well, that's like Mercedes Benz coming out and saying our car is 90 percent better than Lexus. You know, I, <laughs> I need I need a third party unrelated investigative group to come out and say, Oh, yeah, it's 90 percent effective. When the developer of it comes out and says, hey, this is the best thing on the market. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Well, it you isn't know, on the market yet. And no, interestingly enough, though, when you look at I mean. the, that news and how that stuff affects the psyche of people, mm -hmm. you know and I know that the markets went up the first day oh, over absolutely. 1,400 points. Yes. And that's something that is, you know, all of the what's built into, you know, you you see some of these things. You're a cynic, and I can be pretty cynical from time to time. You know, this whole thing is part of the greater landscape of people who have money making more money. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm happy to make more money, and so are you, and so sure everybody else to be more comfortable. But uh, the way this stuff gets set up, people get happy to hear these stories, but then if they look into it, you know, I can throw cold water on almost anything. The way that the investors who basically knew what was going on three days ago. And that's why over the weekend, the stock market ran up because all of these big investors were getting in on Pfizer early because they knew on Monday when it opened up, generally speaking, it was going to go through the roof and other drugs, you know, they all get carried by the weight of one in the rising tide. You know, all the water goes up. Mm -hmm. So all the rest of the drug companies like Eli Lilly, uh, the company that's here in my hometown, uh, that's working on a uh, vaccine. Uh, they all, all of their stocks went way up, even though they don't even have FDA approval yet. Doesn't yeah. make any difference, right? Just yeah, exactly. Uh, and beside the, the beside the point that some of the leading epidemiologists in the country have said, you can't prove without five or six years of testing, you cannot yeah. prove the safety of a vaccine. But everybody is but so all, concerned. Yeah, I want to make sure that we can get our lives back to normal, which is a great. They shouldn't have been thrown off of the normal curve the way they were in the first place. But here Absolutely. you're dealing with the reality of getting things back in order so that the whole country doesn't go bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, now and they've gone too far one way and they got to go back the other way. And who of Joe and, and Jane Doe of, of public is going to sit down and actually take time, hours it would take, to actually to study, study this stuff? No, they're going to say, give me a shot. Exactly. So give me a shot. I want a shot. That's it. I want to move on with my life. So anyway, yeah, you just uh, the FDA approval process sometimes. So there's an antibody treatment that came out from Eli Lilly. And a lot of people are questioning the emergency FDA approval for the right. reason you just stated uh, that it hasn't had four or five years. Hell, when you look at statins, there were a lot of people who were saying when they first came out in the 80s, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Well, fortunately, not a lot has happened. I know that in some cases you disagree with that, and I have been pretty cautious about getting on that bandwagon myself. Uh, but there are things that I, I remember when Viagra first came out, and Bob Dole was out extolling the value. Of, yeah, Viagra is great for your love life. Okay, so that's now. What's going to happen if you take Viagra every night for 30 years? What's going to happen to your body? Exactly. I don't know if there's ever been an answer to that. but Exactly. Exactly. There certainly was no answer to it when they first started selling it. And the same can be said for any drug, and that's the point you're making here. Anything that uh, is new on the market, and boy, are we ever getting a flood of things. Yeah. You know, four or five years down the road, there's going to be, Have you, did you take this drug? Did you have any of these symptoms? Call this number. You might be entitled to reimbursement. Right. Right, exactly. The lawyers will get in on it and they'll sue everybody. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, yeah, listen, yeah. I realize in a crisis situation, a life and death situation, you have got to have some kind of intervention based on pharmaceuticals. I have no problem with that. Yeah. But when we look to that as the only answer 
to the kinds of afflictions that we have, rather than looking at the possibility of, of poisoning in our water, food, and air, the possibility of malnutrition and what that can lead to. You know, we don't think about America being a malnourished country. We're one of the worst on the planet. Yeah, we really are. And yeah. not only are we malnourished, we have undernourished because people just aren't getting enough food. And that food supply question is becoming more controversial because when people didn't find anything in the stores in late March and early April, everything was gone. The food was all gone. People, the light switch went on. Well, where does food come from? And where mm-hmm. do you get the best food? And that's why all the farmers had great seasons. People bought up a lot of stuff. They're canning it. You can't find a, one of those, what do they call it, ball jars anywhere because people are canning and doing yes. all kinds of uh, fruits yeah. and vegetables. Uh, but, you know, now we don't have the farms, so what are we going to do this winter? And now the shelves are getting emptied out again. And so around we go, and you wonder if people learn their lesson thing as much as anything else. The uh, next item of interest here, the, um, the whole business about our, uh, the, the fact that, uh, that uh, Alex Trebek died of pancreatic cancer. Not uh, it is. He's one of the great American icons. So, and he did a, put up a great fight, but most of the time, as not necessarily with other cancers, uh, this cancer is fast moving. Uh, Trebek managed to slow it down a little bit, but it pretty much 95% of the time is a death sentence. You don't find many people that have pancreatic cancer that come out of it. And so, no, what? Very low survival rate. Yeah. What is it? How does, why is it such a problem? Where do, what, why is it so much more vicious? and other cancers that have been apparently now we learn how to treat them and there's much less of a fatality rate among most of the cancers but pancreatic cancer man you get well, it the pancreas you're done. is just so absolutely vital to normal physiology it has a lot of functions but primarily two number one it produces insulin and mm-hmm. you cannot break down the the final aspect of carbohydrates into glucose Um, without some stimulus, and once that glucose gets into the bloodstream, it has to get into the cells. It can't build up in the bloodstream. And without insulin, it's not going to get out of the bloodstream into the cells where the cells need it. And number two, the digestive, the the very powerful protein-digesting enzymes, primarily trypsin and chymotrypsin, and then there's there's several other digestive enzymes that are activated at the time that they're needed to digest food. When they become activated, for whatever reason, tumors or whatever else, before you need them, they will digest you. Mm -hmm. And that's why pancreatic uh, cancer can be so painful and so deadly, because you cannot live without the pancreas. Patrick Swayze was the first one I remember going through it, and it it managed to eliminate him pretty quickly. It's just, it's a very horrible disease, and you hope that no one in your family, nobody to love and care about, is ever going to come down with it. Uh, all right, and we don't, by the way, as a cause, what, the causal end of it, uh, what really is known? Uh, well, that's one of the reasons why we created Long Life Energy Enzymes, was to take, because it's mostly pancreatic enzymes, to take the load mm-hmm. off of the pancreas. Where do they come from, these enzymes? Where do you get them, put them into your mix? They, they are sourced from um, the southern part of New Zealand, which has the cleanest animals on the face of the planet, simply because the air streams, the, the jet streams and all the air currents around the planet miss the bottom part of Australia and they miss Tasmania and they miss New Zealand. So what is falling out of the atmosphere upon the food that these animals eat is the is considered the cleanest animals on the planet. So when these animals are processed, their pancreas is saved in order to obtain these enzymes from the uh, pancreas. Okay. So they're, right, they're mammals. They has to come from a mammal. Yep. Jack Stockwell, Doug Steffen here on Good Day Health. If you don't have a my pillow or know somebody who does have a my pillow now my friends is the time because for a limited time pretty much now I think through Christmas the folks at my pillow offering the premium my pillow sales well I think it was about last year at this time when I remember crowing about this deal where you get 66 percent off the cost of not only the standard and queen premium pillow but the kings as well so to break it down the bottom line is you get a standard queen premium my pillows for $29.98. Normal price on these is $69.98. That's a 
dollar savings and the kings are normally five dollars more at retail you get five dollars more uh it costs you i think what is it 33 or 34 dollars it's really an amazing deal that you get now now is the time to buy you get the lowest prices and you get this is something new you get the 60-day money-back guarantee for my pillow which lasts until march 1st so any product that you buy from my pillow you get all that time to enjoy it to like it to test it if you don't like it just send it back and you get your money back nobody's selling pillows does that except for my pillow you'll find the my pillows at mypillow.com when you check out make sure you use the discount code the promo code djv to get these prices specifically and not to have to pay any shipping charges that's mypillow.com charlie's management team is currently a team of one yeah i got i got a meeting but uh you keep up the good work can you fix that display for me did steve show up today it's time to hire i need indeed indeed you do the moment you sponsor a job on indeed you get a short list of quality candidates from our resume database indeed delivers two and a half times more hires than the other branded job sites combined according to breezy hr 2019 visit indeed.com slash credit and get a 75 dollars credit for your first job post terms and conditions apply fever is a leading symptom of the coronavirus so take your temperature twice a day with the exergen temporal scanner it's quick and easy to use and its accuracy is backed by more than 80 clinical studies have your family start and end their day with the only home thermometer used and recommended by hospitals, doctors, and nurses. Your family can take their temperatures in seconds to know where they stand in the fight against COVID-19. Protect your family from the spread of this deadly disease and stay safe with Exergen. KFC's Colonel Sanders here. We all love sitting down to a home-cooked meal with family, but there's rarely enough hours in the day to do the cooking. So let me do the cooking for you. Well, not me personally. That's just a turn of phrase. Your KFC will do the actual cooking. The point is, let someone else do the home cooking for you. Come to KFC and pick up a $20 fill-up. That's eight pieces of chicken or 12 tenders and all the fixings to feed your family. Order ahead or use contactless delivery at KFC.com. Limited time only at participating locations. Only prices may vary. Tax and substitutions extra. Delivery service and additional fee supply. You probably don't think very often about support for your brain, but you should. Join the millions of people supporting their brain function with America's most popular brain supplement, Prevagen. In a clinical trial, a subgroup of adults with mild, age-related cognitive impairment taking only one Prevagen a day were shown to improve in measures related to memory. Prevagen. Healthier brain, better life. Statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Back to Dr. Jack Stockwell and Doug Steffen here on Good Day Health. One of the things we were talking about earlier, and I don't think we spent enough time on it, is the supplement of the week from Standard Process that you can get through ForbiddenDoctor.com. I started talking about having a little bit of a bowel irregularity, and I thought it was because I was eating Frosted Flakes for the first time in 50 years. If I took Colax, which is the supplement we're talking about, supplement of the week, at ForbiddenDoctor.com, what would happen to me? What would, what would, how would I benefit? How does everybody benefit from it? The body, your body works on signals and chemical messengers. When you start to eat something, chemical messengers are triggered with the parotid gland and in the nature food that you're, mother's nature food that you're eating, that gets the digestive system all the way down to the bottom, ready for what's coming. When those signals aren't there, then that's what, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, that the, the trailer shows up with no wheels. Mm -hmm. So Colax is an incredible uh, herbal product that has cascara, dandelion, yellow dock, dill seed, and chamomile. These herbs have been known for cent literally centuries to be able to keep the digestive tract getting the messages that it needs. To here comes this and here comes that. Okay, we're sending this on. We're going to send this on. Those messages have to be there for certain areas of the bowels to work correctly. So it's very mild. It's very gentle. And I have never seen this thing fail. And it's just C-O-L-A-X to, to, to help to support healthy bowel function. Mm -hmm. And so any time a patient of mine says, hey, you know, I'm feeling a little backed up and a little irregular, and oh, my goodness, you got to take this Colax. You usually never need more than two 
one in the morning, one at night, and within 12 to 24 hours, you are back on track. So then do you stop taking it? How do you know with all these supplements? I've always asked that question. How do you know when enough is enough? Some well, of remember, you take forever. Remember their food. Of- remember their food. And so it takes a while for the body to respond. But eventually, dosages can be decreased and decreased and decreased and actually stopped because nothing is better than Mother Nature's food herself. Right. And when you can move your diet more towards what Mother Nature made, the less you ever need to supplement. In terms of colax, it would seem to me that as we get into Thanksgiving and Christmas Absolutely. and holidays and stuff, yes. we're going to all be eating more. We've been eating more for months. That's why this is so important. Drinking more. you got all kinds of stress. So you get plugged up. That's basically the bottom line. And this will unplug you, it seems like. Colax. Find that along with all the other great stuff. Support systems at ForbiddenDoctor.com, like uh, the uh, the enzymes that Jack has, and the uh, the idea of taking the symptom survey. Do all of that when you're on ForbiddenDoctor.com. Doctor Jack and Doug Stefan at ten before the hour. What can help you take advantage of today's low mortgage rates and save money? Rocket can. You could save hundreds of dollars every month by refinancing with Rocket Mortgage at today's near historic low rates. If your current rate is over 4%, with today's low rates, you could lower your payment by over $150 a month, saving thousands in interest every year. With a cash out refinance from Rocket Mortgage, you could consolidate and pay off high interest debt, tackle home improvements that could add value to your home, or even set aside cash for your child's future education. We've already helped over 1 million clients just like you reach their home financing goals this year alone. So remember this, what can give you the technology to refinance easily and save money? Rocket can. Call us today at 8338-ROCKET or go to rocketmortgage.com. That's 8338-ROCKET or go to rocketmortgage.com. Savings are based on quick loans, internal data, poison fees may apply, call for cost information and conditions, equal housing letter, license in all 50 states, and all consumer access.org, number 330. Our most vulnerable veterans are isolated at hospitals. And during their greatest time of need, their loved ones can have little or no contact with them. Imagine having to shelter in place forever. Learn how you can help at HealVets.org. Help Heal Veterans with the support of citizens like you is making things better together. Learn more at HealVets.org. This message is furnished by Help Heal Veterans, a not-for-profit organization. Fever is a leading symptom of the coronavirus, so take your temperature twice a day with the Exergen Temporal Scanner. It's quick and easy to use, and its accuracy is backed by more than 80 clinical studies. Have your family start and end their day with the only home thermometer used and recommended by hospitals, doctors, and nurses. Your family can take their temperatures in seconds to know where they stand in the fight against COVID-19. Protect your family from the spread of this deadly disease and stay safe with Exergen. Is the cost of finishing the basement worth the benefit of some peace and quiet? When questions find you, Merrill Edge Self-Directed Investing can help you find answers with personalized planning tools and insights to help you get where you want to go, even if it's just downstairs. Merrill, a Bank of America company. Visit MerrillEdge.com slash within reach to get started today. Investing involves risk. Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith Incorporated. Registered broker, dealer, member SIPC. Investment products are not FDIC insured or not bank guaranteed and may lose value. I'm not going very far. It's too uncomfortable. I'm in a hurry. Sometimes I just forget. There's no such thing as a good excuse for not buckling up. You're not only putting yourself at risk of injury or death, it could also cost you lots of money. Cops are writing tickets, so why take the risk? Do the smart thing and start buckling up every trip, day or night. Click it or ticket. Paid for by NHTSA. Lots of, uh, I guess this is pretty usual, lots of information, lots of conversation, lots of questions about what's going on, medically speaking, and it isn't just about COVID. Dr. Jack Stockwell here, Nuka chiropractor, license holder in Nevada. He's got a special clinic there that offers all kinds of help as a Nuka Nevada. chiropractor. As Nevada. What? Nevada. What did I say? Nevada? I did yeah. say that. I always say Nevada instead of Utah. I don't know why I yes. do that. 
And as far as I'm concerned, they're both the same state. And <laughs> well, Nevada gets a lot of business from Utah. That's for sure. No, is that it? Okay. Well, the uh, state, yes. the state board down gambling house, gambling. Yes. Right. Yes. Exactly. All right. So there are a couple of things on my mind to question or query with you. One of yes. them has to be the latest report on sugar sweetened beverages and how it affects those. This is a question for both you and Ken, Ken Kronhaus, the heart specialist. The drinks that supposedly we heard about, what was, how many years ago did we first have diet drinks? How old were you? Do you remember? Was it oh, 40 well, it years ago? Tab. I remember Tab back in the 60s and Fresca. 60s. Yeah, right. And they were, we were told that if you had a thirst for sweet soda, you should buy and drink these diet versions. And in fact, they're more dangerous than the sugar added sweetened drinks. Yeah, they affect the brain. Yes. Yeah. They, it's amazing. The chemicals uh, they affect the brain. Stroke and dementia, Jack. Both yes. of them. Yes. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, those of you who want to substitute, uh, look up online, go to jacksforbiddendoctor.com and find out Mary's recipe for her shake. That'll fix you all right up. Yep, just don't look at the raw egg that's in it. You don't have to put raw egg in it. Everything no. else in there is fantastic. Got it. Okay. Mary's milkshake. Now, let's do some COVID conversation. Sure. The child care centers uh, that are taking, well, the, the whole business about children and COVID, they get it, they don't get it, they pass it along, they don't pass it along. Uh, this uh, study was done where with the uh, children Three in school? Th well, it was done out of Yale University. It was just yep. published in the journal Pediatrics, a peer-reviewed journal. And they looked at responses from 57,000 child care providers throughout the country. And their conclusion, as they looked at groups that were, um, they broke down in two different groups to keep the cohort, to keep the cohort separate. In other words, uh, they found out that the conclusion was uh, it did the uh, the child care centers did not contribute to the spread of the disease, according to these researchers at Yale University in Connecticut. And in particular, they found no evidence of child care being a contributor to COVID-19 transmission between children and adults. This just came out in the journal Pediatrics, and it was Yale University that did this, and there are 57,000 child care centers that were involved in this. And then another thing is that they indicated so that... So what's your conclusion? Okay, so give us the bottom line. Give us the conclusion. It's that they didn't contribute. Children did not contribute to the spread of the virus. Yeah, that right? doesn't mean that everybody doesn't, of course. It no. just meant that the children in child care, in, in child care uh, situations and environments did not contribute to the spread of COVID-19. You don't have mm -hmm. to see children as a spreader. And then the responses also indicated that mask wearing, what mask wearing was not as significant a precautionary measures as the other things that they were doing. Well, that's, a, that's open to interpretation, I think, all of that stuff. I think the first part, I mean, maybe it's just the way you feel individually. Um, uh, it just, for me, uh, I think it's, uh, and I say this lovingly, irresponsible to say that there's nothing that comes out of wearing a mask. You yourself have given us the micron. I went out and bought those micron, single micron masks because I thought that was an important mm -hmm. issue. And if you wear the heavy cloth ones, they're about that. But I just think it's polite. It is, uh, it's, it's just something, even though it isn't necessarily life and death, it's just... I don't, it just, there's a comfort level, Jack, that goes with it. I don't know how else to describe it, frankly. Well, and you don't either. <laughs> Utah. Uh, well, I have I have my opinions too. Yes, and you do. Utah, I know you. Yeah. As of 1 p.m. yesterday, Utah came under a significant statewide mask wearing uh, mandate for two weeks. They're going to do it mm -hmm. for two. Uh, last time they said they're going to do it for two weeks, we're only for months. But the governor came out. The governor came out last night and said, "All right, get you know out of the pool. Come on, get out of the pool. Put your mask back on. Put the mask on. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Here's the way to lose weight for those of you who don't want to worry about the virus. As most of the medical professionals, Jack and Ken, will tell you, the number one candidate for having the coronavirus is somebody who's overweight, who has problems with diabetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Lose the weight. Get yourself into shape. Go to toploss.com. Get yourself into this awesome health 
the formula for Calatrin is so healthy, no stimulants, no drugs. It's all about being healthy. Lose that weight. Go to toploss.com. Use the DJV code at checkout. How do we raise kids who can survive this mad, mad world and make it better? You know, being grateful is like armor because it keeps in mind the fact that you're not alone. What happens when kids don't know they're loved? I hated everything. I hated the whole world. And how do you help kids recover when somebody hurts them? There is a poison in the world called resentment. I'm Carol Lloyd, and this is Like a Sponge, great schools podcast for parents about the science of how kids flourish. This season, we take a sharp turn into the land of character, that stuff inside us that makes us strong, kind, brave, resilient, that stuff we want our kids to have an unlimited supply of before they inherit this divided nation we grown-ups have created. Like a Sponge is distributed by PRX Radio and is available on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. The Lutheran Hour, bringing Christ to the nations. No matter how big our problems may seem, God invites us to have faith in something outside of us, in someone bigger than us. Our guest speaker today is Pastor Gerard Bowling. The thing about life in Christ is that you see oftentimes what you experience is bigger than you. What you experience is actually God showing himself to his people. It wasn't about you after all. It it was about him and the work that he was doing through you and in you. Later, Dr. Andrew Steinman shares further insights into the book of Daniel. Hello, I'm Mark Eicher. Thanks for joining us today in this, our 90th year. Your gifts and prayers help the Lutheran Hour bring Christ to the nations and the nations to the church. The Reverend Gerard Bowling is pastor of Bethlehem Lutheran Church in St. Louis. Now with a message titled, Bigger, here is Pastor Bowling. A reading from Daniel 6. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And at this time, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, We will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators and prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, must be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty... Issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day. He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. 
Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except for you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree that you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Then the king heard this, and he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and make every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave this order, and they brought him Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him. He could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And he came near the den, and he called out to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, May the king live forever. God has sent his angel, and he has shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed, and he gave orders to lift Daniel up out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And at the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and people of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of the kingdom, there must be fear and reverence before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. The kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. This is the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Both of my children were born on the same exact day at nearly the same exact time at the same exact birth weight just two years apart from one another. My son Lincoln was born on October 5th, 2016, at 12.07 p.m. at 8 pounds and 9 ounces. My daughter Monroe was born on October 5th, 2018, at 11.32 a.m. at 8 pounds and 9 ounces. Both the first and second time around as a parent, 
There has been no greater joy than holding that little baby in the palm of my hands, small as ever, scrunched up into a little ball as they curl their little hand around my finger, and suddenly the whole world seems to get a whole lot smaller. As I watch my child, as I hold my child, as they drift their way to sleep. There's no better moment than that. You realize at a moment like that, that an incredibly small child that you hold in the crux of your arms is resting because they lean on the forearms of someone bigger than them, someone meant to protect them, to love them, and to care for them. Well, as children do, my kids have grown. The pencil on the table by my kitchen cabinet grows dull as it marks my children up from the 20 and 21 inches they started at vertically into heights that are, are unknown as they turned two and four years old recently and they're still growing. And with each passing year, with each October 5th, my children make many wishes. And of course, as children do, they wish for more toys to crowd my living room floor with or for sweet treats to fill their tummies with, but they never fail to wish for one singular thing. Consistently, they say, I wish I was bigger. Bigger! It's always about being bigger, wanting to be taller and, and faster and stronger and more capable and more advanced, bigger. Children have it set in their minds to get bigger, and as adults, we have other thoughts on being bigger. Thoughts that likely crossed Daniel's mind in our reading for today. See, it says in the word of God that Daniel, a servant of God, began distinguishing himself as a worker. In other words, he was getting bigger as he grew in his vocation as a commissioner over the satraps of the kingdom so that the king would not suffer loss, but instead the kingdom would expand. He became bigger as he was being considered for a promotion, being that he was such an excellent commissioner, and word began to travel that King Darius was fond of him. Daniel was growing from a servant to a ruler of many. The hypothetical pencil was dull with its dashing of his progress along the doorpost of life. He was getting bigger. And as he grew, uh, as people do, jealousy began to spread as an eraser to his pencil marks. So much so that he found himself subjected to be lowered into a lion's den, a pit where nature's cats ruled, to be devoured by something bigger than him. And as he is lowered down to the pit of lions, the deepest pit, Daniel is likely reminded of just how small he is. I'm a 90s baby, and toys were at an all-time high in the 1990s. Best toys ever made. One of my favorite toys when I was young was a toy you could hardly play with. See, it would come in a pack of two. They were these sort of spongy sea creatures like a, a starfish or an octopus. And you would leave one sea creature on your nightstand and take the other sea creature and put it into a clear glass of tap water. You'd go to sleep that night. And when you woke up, something astonishing would happen. One starfish that you left out on the table, well, that starfish would stay the same size. But the other starfish that you put into the glass of water would be so big that its body would pour out of the glass of water onto the night table even, and it would grow that big overnight. It, it got so much bigger with nothing ever happening. What a miracle, my young mind would think. But when I became older, I realized something, that the starfish wasn't getting any bigger on its own. Instead, the starfish would soak up all the water into its pores. It would fill it up, and it would go to the size that I had seen with my eyes. It was never the starfish actually getting bigger. It was the water 
entering the starfish that gave it its size. See, Daniel understood that though he was lowered into the lion's pit, there stood another with him. That he, like us, was just a miserable little dried up creature on the nightstand, not, not capable of anything, not useful for anything, that he would never get any bigger. But what Daniel knew was that God was with him. If God poured out his spirit into Daniel, then it would fill him up and he would be able to stand in the lion's pit because there was another who was subjected to be lowered into the pit. There was another who was made to face the lions of death. There was another who had a large rock rolled against it as it was to be a tomb. There was another who had the tomb sealed and shut. There was another who stayed there all day Friday, all day Saturday, and all night Saturday night. But early Sunday morning rose again. And when that woman ran to the tomb, when the women ran and were panicking and they said, where did they take Jesus? Just like when King Darius woke up after a sleepless night and he screamed to Daniel, Daniel, servant of God, whom you serve continually, God has he rescued you from the lions? Daniel, just like Jesus, lived because the living God is bigger than the lions, bigger than sin, bigger than death, bigger than the devil. The living God who's able to part the Red Sea, who's able to cause giants to fall, who's able to cause cities to crumble and the mouth of lions to be shut. That living God who is bigger, who is greater, that is the God whom we call Savior. And most of all, his plans are bigger. One of the most emotional ministry experiences I have ever had was at Barnes Jewish Hospital here in St. Louis. One of our members at Bethlehem Lutheran Church had just had a baby. Normally, this would be a happy and joyous occasion, but in this case, it was a very worrisome one. See, that baby was born four months early. The prognosis was not good, and I was asked to come and baptize the baby and spend some time with her as her future was unpredictable. I arrived at the hospital and made my way up to the NICU. And as I walked in and greeted the family, I walked up to the smallest child to date that I have ever seen in my life. A child who could barely fit in the palm of anyone's hands. I lightly stroked her head, and I used an eyedropper to baptize her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that day, with many unknowns ahead, the very certain promise of God was bestowed on that child. And as I left the hospital in tears, I realized that if God's purpose for me to become a pastor was simply to baptize that child, then it was worth it. See, the thing about life in Christ is that you see oftentimes what you experience is bigger than you. What you experience is actually God showing himself to his people. It wasn't about you after all. It, it was about him and the work that he was doing through you and in you. Daniel 6, 26 shows God doing something bigger than Daniel being in a lion's den. God takes that one experience that Daniel had and God magnifies it. God moves King Darius's heart to declare in every part of the kingdom that people fear and know the God of Daniel. God touches lives through Daniel. God makes his family bigger through the faithfulness of Daniel. So instead of the rallying cry of, I wish I was bigger, we ought to thank God for helping us to realize that he is bigger. And we can soak in his promises that fill us up until the pencil marks are needed no more and we go to enter our rest with him. In Jesus' name. Amen. You're listening to The Lutheran Hour, celebrating 90 years of bringing Christ to the nations and the nations to the church.
For free online resources, archived audio, our mobile app, and more, go to lutheranhour.org. And we're joined now by our Lutheran Hour speaker, Dr. Michael Ziegler. We just heard a message from Pastor Gerard Bowling, who is a graduate of Concordia University Chicago, which also happens to be the institution where our interview guest is serving currently and has served as professor for the last 20 years. I'm speaking again with Dr. Andrew Steinman. Welcome back, Andy. Good to be back with you. What keeps you energized to teach the Old Testament after all these years? The thing that really excites me about the Old Testament is no matter where you are, if you understand it correctly, it's pointing you to Jesus. And I'm excited to show my students, it's not a history book per se, it's a book about the coming Savior. What insights does Daniel have for us as we witness to our faith in Jesus? Well, I think one of the great insights um, that Daniel gives us is Daniel and his companions back in chapter 2, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, speak to the moment. They use the moment to speak about their faith and to share their faith. They don't speak about it in abstract terms, but they actually talk about the context they're in to the people that they are bringing God's word to. When Daniel, you know, is confronted about his worship of God, and he's going to be thrown into the lion's den. Daniel uses the context to speak to Darius, and you get the feeling that Darius knows he's been kind of cornered, and Darius wants to um, find a way to get rid of this problem with Daniel. And Daniel says, don't worry about it. I know God's in control. Uh, he, he basically comforts Darius in that context. If we can contrast that to chapter 2, the context is one where Nebuchadnezzar is trying to force Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to worship their God. And they are a little more defiant than Daniel is because of that context. But they use that context to say to the king, no matter how powerful you are, our God is more powerful. We're not going to give in to you. And so the book of Daniel teaches us to use the context and to be sensitive to the uh, context we're in when we are bringing the Word of God to people, to understand what their situation is, and to try to use the Word of God as it speaks to their particular situation. And I think that's so very important because it's so easy just to have our own agenda. Uh, well, you've got to know this about Jesus. You've got to know that about the Word of God. Instead of saying, what is it that's in the Word of God that speaks to the situation of the person to whom I am trying to be a, a servant of Christ towards. How might that help gain a hearing for the good news of Jesus? You know, there's always a, a, a natural resistance when you're speaking to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, who, who's not a Christian. And especially in our culture, where uh, oftentimes there's a suspicion of Christians. Among people who, who don't know us, uh, they oftentimes wonder, you know, what kind of weird people are these? And so to show that we can empathize with them, that we can, we understand their concerns and their needs, automatically begins to bridge that gap. And then it gives us the opportunity to let them see what we see in Jesus Christ as the solution to all life's pressing problems. Um, not that life's pressing problems are going to go away when they know Jesus. We know that doesn't happen. We, we still have them as Christians, but that we have the comfort of Christ in the midst of all those troubles and anxieties and worries. And, you know, this is something that we all do imperfectly. And, and I have to admit, you know, I failed at times, not always putting myself in my student's shoes when they ask a question. But I at least try to ask myself, what is behind that question? Why are they asking that particular question and what an, another one? So that when I tailor my answer, hopefully I'm answering in a way that that meets that need that they felt bubbling up as they answered or you know, asked that question. 
And then I can follow up by saying, you know, I, I hope I've brought you some comfort. Is there something else I can do or some other words I can give you if I haven't done that? That also helps reinforce, hopefully, a relationship that we've established. Whether we like to admit it or not, most of bringing people to Jesus is about relationships. Right. I'm, I'm sure there are people who have found a Bible, maybe they found the Gideon's Bible in their hotel room and they read it and they became a Christian. But most people become a Christian because of relationships they've had. With me, it was my parents. They brought me to church. They nurtured me. With other people, it's a friend or a coworker or somebody they've gotten to know. And it's those relationships through which the Holy Spirit works to bring people to Jesus. And so we work on that. And that's what Daniel does in the book. He works on that relationship with the kings he serves. Those relationships enable him to give the kings he serves insight into what God is trying to tell them. And even if in Daniel's case, I'm not sure Nebuchadnezzar actually ever becomes a Christian, but he becomes more and more appreciative of what Daniel has said. And maybe at the end of his life, Nebuchadnezzar did become a believer in the Savior to come. The same thing with Darius later on. The book doesn't tell us that they these two men became believers in the Savior to come, but it leads us to believe that they were on the way there. And hopefully they did make it for their sake. And I, I appreciate how you say it's it started with Daniel seeing in them a common humanity that he he feels he cares for these kings, even though they are cruel, even though they did so much uh, damage to, to his own people, or even back to chapter two, how he identifies with the wise men. He appeals to Nebuchadnezzar to to not put the wise men to death. Uh, he, so he starts by identifying and then, like you said, using that as a relationship or, or starting with a relationship to to move forward. It seems to me that what God has done is uh, called us to be in relationships with those around us and not just our fellow Christians, although that's obviously a very blessed relationship we have, but to be in relationships with others around us so that the Holy Spirit can work through those and the words we bring and the examples we set to bring people toward Jesus and hopefully all the way to Jesus. And and we pray that he will help us recognize the moment when it yes. comes and have the courage to speak. Yes. Thank you for joining us again, Andy. We'll, uh, we'll talk again uh, later as we get later in the book. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Looking ahead to next week's program, political turmoil is nothing new and political security is temporary at best. However, Dr. Michael Ziegler points to a kingdom of grace and justice that will never pass away in a message titled Politics in Perspective. And author Carrie Vo previews our new Advent devotions next week. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. This has been a presentation of Lutheran Hour Ministries.
Ocala's Appleton Museum of Art has reopened to all visitors. See the world-class permanent collection and special exhibits, including photographs by Bruce Mozart and mixed media by Christina Deanne. Hours are Thursday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Sundays, noon to 5 p.m. The museum is closed Mondays through Wednesdays. Masks are required, and visitor occupancy is being monitored. For more information, visit AppletonMuseum.org. Gene Powell Pasture Mowing, 352-629-2440. In addition to our pasture mowing and tractor services, including zero-turn mowers for your fence line finish, we also offer rototilling and fence row spraying. We are family-owned and operated, licensed and insured, and farm-ready. Powell Gene, G-E-N-E, at yahoo.com, 352-629-2440. Gene Powell Pasture Mowing, 352-629-2440. Gene is a proud United States veteran. Veterans Helping Veterans USA. Call 352-433-2320. We help veterans and their families with limited financial assistance, counseling, employment referrals, and a food and clothing bank. You can help in making a huge difference in the veterans' lives we serve by donating food, clothing, household items, or direct financial assistance. All donations are tax deductible. Veterans Helping Veterans USA. 352-433-2320. Thank you for your attention and God bless America. Hello, my friend. I'm James Snyder, pastor of the Family of God Fellowship, located in Silver Springs Shores. Welcome to Sunday Joy. If you don't have a home church, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to join us today for worship. I'll give you details of our church in a few moments. The Family of God Fellowship exists to glorify God and celebrate the Christian experience through fellowship, discipleship, and stewardship. It's a privilege to share with you these few moments together. The Bible says, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. I invite you to join my friends and me for the next few moments in celebrating the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. And may the Lord bless our moments together today. Hi, I'm Steve Brown of Key Life. You know, it costs a lot to give a child life. Many times, a woman is forced to make a bad choice because of financial pressures. You can help them choose life instead of abortion. Take a stand for life. Purchase your Choose Life license plate from your county tag office today. For more, go to choose-life.org or call toll-free 877-454-1203. What's in a name anyway? I can't express how ecstatic I was when somebody gave me a coupon for a free donut. Normally, I'm not overly excited about free. All I had to do was fill out a little survey online, and they would send me a code that would guarantee me a free donut. In my daily diary diet, I have a whole section devoted to the subject that when a forbidden food is free, it cancels out all calories. When I first told the gracious mistress of the parsonage, she looked at me rather strangely and said, Who said that? <laughs> I know we are both getting old, but we're not that old. I got close to her, waved my hand so she could see me and said, It's me. I just said it. Can you hear me now? That's not funny. You know exactly what I meant. <laughs> well, my grin drained from my face, and I said to her, well, I said it. Did, she said inquisitively, anybody ever say that before you said it? My wife has many talents, skills, and gifts. It would be difficult for me to say which is her best gift, but at the moment, her greatest skill is backing me into a corner, and into a corner I was thus backed. I then had to explain to her in detail how this was an observation I worked through with much research. This is an original with me, and I'm quite proud to be the author. She said, ah, uh, that is exactly what I thought. I will go to my grave believing when a donut is free, it means it's free of calories. Call it what you will, but free by any other name is still free in my personal dictionary. Well, getting back to my free donut, I was anxious to get to the donut shop 
cash in the coupon and enjoy a donut. I don't know when the best time to eat a donut is, so I just started at my convenience. I got the donut shop, walked in, and the smell was overpowering. Nothing like the smell of donuts baking in the oven with a hint of coffee brewing in the background. I just stood there for a few seconds absorbing the luxuriousy of this marvelous atmosphere. It's not often I can enjoy such luxuries, especially if my wife knows where I am. When I became adjusted to the ambience, I walked up to the counter and presented my coupon for a free donut. It was at that moment I saw them. I know I'm not the most observant person at the circus. Many things get by me without noticing them. Sometimes I am just in deep thought and not aware of my surroundings. I can relate to Walter Mindy in my, many ways. There they were, freshly baked apple fritters. I was stunned. I had just never crossed my mind that a donut shop would have this kind of delicious tidbit. But there they were, freshly baked and staring at me with alluring eyes of desire. I don't know how much better a day can get than this. When I got up this morning, I did not realize this would be a wonderful day. There, there they were, stared at me, and I stared back, and immediately there was a connection. Standing in line, I could hardly wait for my turn to order. I presented my coupon for a free donut, and the young woman behind the counter said, Which donut can I get for you, sir? I savored a moment, licked my drying lips, and said, I'll have an apple fritter. With that said, I sighed a deep sigh of true contentment. I'm sorry, sir, the young woman said. There's no need to be sorry, young lady, I said as cheerfully as I possibly could. No, sir, I'm sorry, but an apple fritter is not a donut. Now, I can take a joke as well as anybody else. In fact, I have put forth my share of jokes. However, an apple fritter is no joking matter. Excuse me, I said most breathlessly. An apple fritter is not a donut, so what donut would you like me to get for you? The thought began unfolding in my mind at this point that she was not joking. She sincerely believed an apple fritter was not a donut. I know an apple fritter is among the uh, Cadillac of donuts, but in my mind it is still a donut. I did not have much opportunity to set this young woman straight with one of the great fundamentals of life. I had to take one of her free donuts along with my coffee, go to a corner and think about these things. What good is free if it's not really what you want? Sometimes people use the word free as a device to get you to a place where they can sell you something else. The Bible is the only place I will accept a free offer. One particular verse sets this forth quite nicely. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's John chapter 8, verse 32. This is often used out of context. The truth that makes us free indeed is none other than the truth about Jesus Christ. He, he is the only one capable of delivering something absolutely free. An unexpected pregnancy can turn a young woman's life upside down. The House of One in Faith in Ocala gives these young women a place to live in privacy and comfort under the Christian care of counselors who will guide and protect both the woman and her unborn child. The House of One in Faith is confidential, loving, and free. For more information, call 352-687-8895. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is Lee Helsell, editor of the South Marian Citizen, inviting you to read Pastor Snyder's religion column, Out to Pastor, each Friday. Please take your Bible and turn with me to the Epistle of Jude. The Epistle of Jude. One chapter, 25 verses. Quite a, a short little book. But even though it's a short little book, it has quite a message 
that uh, we need to understand and look at. So Jude chapter 1, if you want to call it chapter, I want to begin with verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are two very powerful verses. And what Jude is trying to get us to see here is that there's some danger in the church. Now, he begins this by saying, I wanted to write unto you uh, concerning uh, our common salvation. He wanted to give testimony of, of what this salvation is. Now, when he says common salvation, he's talking about that salvation that is for all brothers and sisters in Christ. There is only one salvation. There's only one way to God. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jude was anxious to share this testimony of this common salvation and how wonderful it is, no matter what our past has been, how wonderful it is to find that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and, and cleansed and, and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, Jude is saying here, I, I started out to write about our common salvation, but then I think the Holy Spirit began to stir up his heart, and he says that he, he, he is now leading, being led of the Holy Spirit to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And I think that is the message for today. It started back in Jude's day, and it's never changed. Uh, the Old Testament, Solomon says, there is nothing new under the sun. And when we come up with something new, there's something wrong with it. And I'm not talking about technology. I'm talking about the message, the message that we need to contend for the faith. And that means several things. First of all, it means we need to understand what that faith is. What is my faith? in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a Christian? Is it worth being a Christian? Uh, I want to talk about that in church this next Sunday. Is it worth being a Christian with all of the suffering and, and uh, sacrifice that is associated with it? And so Jude is saying here, I'm going to exhort you to stand and contend for the faith. That's what we need today. You know, that's what we need in America today. We have all kinds kinds of religions and, and all kinds of religiosity in our country. But boy, it's hard to find a genuine uh, born-again Christian living and contending for the faith. You find him, and when you find him, it's such a, such a joy, isn't it? And so we need to contend for the faith. Now, why do we need to contend for the faith? Well, Jude points out here, verse 4 for there are certain men crept in unawares. They are sneaking into the church. Now, why do they sneak into the church? Because they are being motivated by the devil. The devil wants to sneak into the church. And let me point this out, that the devil is not the Hollywood's picture of the devil. You know how they picture him with horns and a pitchfork and a long tail and, and red and all that kind of stuff. That's a bunch of nonsense. If, you, if the devil would walk into your church this Sunday, and nobody would recognize him as the devil. He would be a pleasant, wonderful person. That's how the devil is. He's a deceiver. When he appeared to Eve in the Garden of Eden, she wasn't frightened of him because he was very charming. A con artist is a very charming person. I did a lot of study on Bernie Madoff, one of the great, great uh, con artists. 
what was $65 billion that he stole from people. And I wanted to see what kind of a person he was. And if he walked into the, into your supper or whatever, he'd be so wonderful and charming and, and all of that kind of stuff. That's the devil, my friend. The devil creeps in unawares. You don't know he's there. By the time you know the devil is there, it's almost too late to do anything. And that's why Jude says we need to contend for the faith. We need to stand up for the faith. And if anything, anybody twists the faith in any degree, we need to stand up against that. Sometimes people will say, well, uh, you know, Every, anybody can make a mistake. Okay, you know, this past year we've had these uh, prophets stand up. I don't know what the outcome is going to be yet. I'm a little early for that in, in taping here. But uh, they have prophesied who is going to win the presidential election. Well, I think that's a very dangerous thing to do because if that person they prophesy doesn't win, then they are a false prophet. And down through the years, these prophets have prophesied things that never became true. And yet nobody rebukes them. Nobody stands up against them. If you make one false prophecy, you are a false prophet. You are a heretic. If I had a gallon of water here and I put in just one drop of cyanide poisoning, you know, it would affect the whole water. You wouldn't be able to drink around that poison. The poison would infect the whole gallon of water. And so I think this is what, what Paul or Jude is trying to get across here, that one little bit of, of uh, falsifying the gospel uh, contaminates the whole thing. And we need to stand up against them. If, if somebody wants to prophesy, it better be rooted and grounded in the Scripture. And if it's not, we're dealing with a heretic. And we need to rebuke them and push them aside. So listen to what Jude says. Uh, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a powerful thing to say here. These men have come in to destroy the gospel. Now, listen very carefully. Not to throw the gospel out. Oh, no. But to update it. We, we need to update. Back in the, what was it, 1870s, when Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher in London, there was a movement among Christian churches, and uh, Spurgeon uh, identified it as the downgrade controversy. And what the churches were saying back then was that we need to downgrade the gospel message so that the culture can understand it. And boy, Spurgeon stood up against that. He was one of the few that stood up against that. And now we have in our country, we have the same thing. Uh, even, even today, what we're saying is we need to re-identify, rephrase what we believe so that the culture can understand it. Oh, my friend, if the culture understands the gospel, then it's really not the gospel. It is only through the work of the Holy Spirit that someone can understand what the gospel is all about. We cannot appeal to the, to the culture. We need to raise up Christ. We need to lift up and glorify God in our country today. And then we will begin to see the work of the Holy Spirit. If we preach the gospel, if we preach the word of God as presented in the Bible, if we preach it, we will be uh, uh, enemies of the culture. The culture cannot accept what the Bible teaches. And so therefore, oh boy, I need, to, I need to water it down a little bit so I don't want to offend anybody. Well, you know, as a person, I don't want to offend anybody, but I tell you this, I don't want to compromise the truth either. I'm going to tell the truth, the Bible truth. I don't care about politics or economics or anything like that. I don't know much about that, but I'm talking about Bible truth. The Bible truth, I'm not going to downgrade it. I'm not going to compromise it. I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to try to get this gospel and fit it into the culture. I'm going to lift up the gospel of Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit work through what I'm trying to do. And that's what 
Jude is telling to the people, uh, we need to contend for the faith. We need to stand for what the Bible says. I don't care what the culture says. I don't care what the, the, the uh, uh, psychologist says and the psychiatrist and the philosophers <laughs> and on and on we can go. After all, scientists have always been right. Yeah? <laughs> well, that's a lie. They, they only know what they know. They don't know what they don't know. But when I come to the Word of God, I know Christ. I don't know everything. I must say when I come to the Bible, there's a lot of things that I really don't understand. And so my faith is not by sight. My walk with God is not by sight, but by faith. And I trust God. And the more I get into the Word, the more I am able to trust the Word. And the more I'm able to trust the Word, the more responsibility I have to contend for the faith to make sure that I'm living the life, to make sure I'm believing what the Bible says, and then to stand against anything that will contradict that. Now, that's going to cause a lot of problems, isn't it? All you have to do, read Fox's Book of Martyrs, read about the, the apostles and the early church and, and, and all of the persecution that came upon them, uh, because the world wants to be accepted by everybody, and the world wants the Bible to be readjusted so that uh, they're not under conviction. Ah, now there's the word, conviction. People do not want to be convicted. They, they, oh yes, I, you know, not everybody's perfect. I know I made a mistake. La, 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 la. That's not it, my friend. What it is, is sin. I need to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. And in that conviction, I need to surrender and confess and repent and allow the Holy Spirit to rejuvenate me and transform me into the image of Christ. And so I'm walking in faith. I'm not walking by sight. Um, I don't know where I'm going. Often in our Bible studies, we get off, off on a rabbit trail sometimes, and we talk about what's heaven going to be like? What, what are we going to have in heaven? What are we going to do in heaven? Do you know there's not very much said in the Bible about our activity in heaven, <laughs> what we're going to be doing? What are we going to be eating? Eating, and uh, will we know each other? Well, I think we will. Uh, but there's so much about heaven that we don't know. And yet there is a passion in my heart since I became a Christian, a passion for heaven. When I die, I'm going to go into heaven. When, when this body collapses, I will be in the presence of the Lord. And so there's a lot of things about heaven I don't know. But I still believe in heaven because the Bible says it's true, because the Bible says it's so. And so I'm going to come to the word of God and I'm going to contend for the faith, the common salvation that we have in Christ. I'm going to contend for that. I'm going to stand for that. And anybody that, that is falsifying the gospel, I need to rebuke. You know, what did Jesus do? Didn't he rebuke the Pharisees? Didn't he chase the money changers out of the temple? I mean, he wasn't to pat, he, pat you on the head and say, okay, I understand. Good boy. Now, good boy. No, he didn't do that. He, he, he told the, the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Now, that doesn't seem like it makes a, a good friends there. No, no, we're not to, we're not to com, be complacent with the culture. We are to be standing on the Word of God. And if I'm standing on the Word of God, then the Holy Spirit is going to be flowing through me and guiding and directing me. And if the Holy Spirit is doing that, then the people I come in contact with will be touched with, with conviction. And either they will surrender to the Holy Spirit and confess their sins, or they're going to run the other way. Most of them, you know, run the other way. But that's not my job. My job, as Jude says here, is to contend for the faith and to, and to understand that there are men that have come into the church, not the local church, uh, but that happens as well, 
but into the body of Christ that are trying to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I walk with the Lord and as I read the scriptures, I need to trust God to give me wisdom and discernment to recognize these people. And when I recognize these people, I need to stand for the faith, I need to contend for the faith, and I need to rebuke them. Because if I don't rebuke them, that poisonous heresy will infect the church and how many people will, will be suffering for it. We need to stand for God today. And, and uh, God is not a religious person. Religiosity does more to harm the gospel than, than atheism, you know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me that more atheists believe in God than, than people who call themselves Christians. If an atheist didn't believe in God, why does he get all upset when he hears the name God? And why does he do everything he can to get rid of it? If I didn't believe in something I, and I would see it, I would chuckle and say, <laughs> look at that, that's foolish, and then go on my life. But an atheist cannot stand God. You know why? Because down deep in their heart, they know that there is a God. They just are standing against that truth and are trying to rebuke, <laughs> rebuke uh, Christianity. And so I need to stand. Christianity needs to have a, a, a real re rerouting rerouting, reformation, uh, revival, all of that kind of stuff. We are in, in, in bad shape and we need, uh, one of the Tozer books I'm working on, one of the chapters has to do with prayer. And you know what he says? He says, the worst thing in the church today is unanswered prayer. And I've been thinking about that and, and that is so, so true. The worst thing in my heart are prayers that are not answered. They're either not answered because I'm not asking them right or I'm, I'm living contrary to uh, God's standards and so forth. I need to make sure that my prayers are being answered. And if my prayers are being answered, then I can begin praying for these people around us. Prayer is a powerful thing. Uh, Mary, uh, Queen Mary of Scotland or something like that, uh, said that she feared the prayers of John Knox more than all of the armies in Europe. Because when he prayed, John Knox, when he prayed, something happened. And I need to come to this. I need to contend for the faith. I need to be in such a position with God, such a relationship with God, that I will, number one, recognize the heresy, number two, rebuke the heretic, and number three, encourage believers to really stand for the truth and really put their heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. What about you? Jude is saying here, we need to contend for the faith. Jude is saying here, there's danger uh, afoot and we need to recognize it and we need to stand against it. And when he talks about the common faith, we need to come together as brothers and sisters in the Lord and stand together and pray together and rebuke together the heresies that are really taking over the church today. If you know of a young woman burdened with an unwanted pregnancy, please tell her about the House of One and Faith in Ocala. This free and confidential residence helps pregnant teen girls in a family atmosphere while forming an adoption plan. Part of the Ministry of Family of God Fellowship, the House of One and Faith offers a safe, loving environment. Call 352-687-8895 for more information. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word today. Holy Spirit, thank you for ministering to our hearts. And we pray today for those who are listening. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you might minister to their hearts in a way that will lift them up above the circumstances that they're in. We pray for our country, O oh Father, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would work out through our country the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with those who are suffering, and we ask, Lord, that in all things you will be honored and praised. For we ask this, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Rejoice in the Lord, rejoice. 
I want to thank you for joining us today for Sunday Joy. I trust it's been an uplifting time for you. I know we enjoyed putting this little program together. Let me take this opportunity to invite you to visit the Family of God Fellowship. We are one of the friendliest churches you could ever visit, and I'm sure one visit will convince you of this very thing. Our church is located at 1471 Pine Road, out in the Silver Spring Shores area. Our Sunday morning worship service is at 1030, where we sing hymns and choruses to the glory of God, as well as share testimonies of God's amazing grace. There's a fully staffed nursery for infants and an exciting children's church program, and always a Bible-based sermon to help you in your daily life. And then each Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, we have a special evening service for all ages. Uh, we have a special program for children, including Word of Life clubs and uh, special programs for the younger kids. They make arts and crafts and play games and sing hymns and learn Bible stories. The adults also are involved in a Bible study program. And I want you to consider this to be your personal invitation to join our church family and me today as we worship God and give Him glory. Again, our church is located at 1471 Pine Road, which is in Silver Springs Shores. For directions to our church, simply call us at 687-4240. That's 687-4240. I look forward to seeing you in church this Sunday. Again, thank you for joining us today. And until next week, may God richly bless you, my friend. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. AAA is projecting less Americans on the road Thanksgiving weekend. USA Radio News' Dan Naraki has the details. Fewer Americans will be hitting the road for the Thanksgiving holiday, according to AAA. The Auto Club expects about 10% fewer travelers for this year's holiday, the largest one-year drop since the height of the Great Recession in 2008. They say air travel will take a hit, with about half as many flyers this year, 2.4 million, down from 4.5 million a year ago. Auto travel is expected to drop as well, though not as dramatically. AAA expects a 4% drop to 47.8 million Americans hitting the road for Turkey Day. The reasoning behind the expected drops are the increasing numbers of coronavirus cases across the country. From the USA Radio News Ohio Bureau, I'm Dan Naraki. Hundreds of thousands of President Trump supporters invaded Washington, D.C. Saturday in support of President Trump's claim of voter fraud. The large gathering's message was, stop the steal. The Democrats and Joe Biden claim it was the fairest election in U.S. history. USA Radio News. We've all heard it. Eat healthy. But what does eating healthy mean? Sure, there are countless diets out there, but they contradict each other. Yet all experts agree we should eat a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. Whole fruits and vegetables are the perfect fuel to power the cells in your body, giving you the stamina you need to handle your day-to-day -day activities. And that's what Balance of Nature is. Whole fruits and vegetables delivered to you in a convenient capsule form for only 22 cents a serving. Our proprietary blend has no additives or fillers, just the full nutritional value of a variety of 31 different fruits and vegetables. Balance of Nature provides you with a natural energy boost without a caffeine crash, a 3 o'clock slump, or an early bedtime. Experience the Balance of Nature difference for yourself by going to Balance of